Hey guys, today is Thursday, October 22nd. Yesterday you should have gone through a PowerPoint that kind of showed you a little bit about each of the animals and showed you pictures of animals in jars, pictures of specimens laying on the counter. Um, those are the same specimens we looked at in class. Those are pictures of the specimens we looked at in class. So it should have shown you a little bit about all of the different phylums of animals and what all to expect this semester and what all is coming this semester. So today we're going to dive right into the very first phylum and the very first and the most simplest kind of animals and their phylum periphera. So let's pull up Schoology and see what the assignments actually are today. Let me minimize myself. All right, so today it says that we need to open the PowerPoint and complete the notes, complete the sponge reading, and then do the questions, the worksheet, and the sponge labeling. It seems like a lot. It's not that much, guys. So without further ado, let's start with the sponge notes. So a sponge is an animal. Think SpongeBob SquarePants. That's a sponge. It is the simplest animal. So if we have a cladogram, or in a cladogram, you're, we have a single-celled ancestor. There's not 100% agreement on what that single-celled ancestor is, but there is a single-celled ancestor of some kind. And from that one single-cell ancestor, the <clears throat> species or animal slowly started to evolve. We've got lots of things in here called protists that are single-cell, but they have all the qualifications to be an animal. They're heterotrophic. They consume outside food. That's heterotrophy. Um, they're heterotrophic. They're eukaryotes but they're single cell, so they can't be considered an animal. So further down the line, the trait of multicellularity was introduced, and the very first animal that appeared would be the sponge or the periphera. So if you look down here, we've got our single-celled ancestor, we've got multicellularity, and sponges are the very first thing. So they're a very, very basic animal. They don't do much. So, um, organization-wise, sponges are the simplest multicellular organism. We think that sponges are actually the very first multicellular organism. So we think that they are considered one of those um, living fossil species that have been around since the dinosaurs and that were around before the dinosaurs. They are a complex arrangement of specialized cells. So each cell in a sponge is independent of the cell next to it, but they all work together for a common goal. And each cell is specialized. So there's no true tissues or organs. Um, when you think about tissues, you should think about like skin is a tissue or you've got, you know, your stomach and all of those cells work together to digest your food. Nothing like that occurs in this animal. So they're very, very basic. At the bottom, when most people think of sponges, obviously they think of SpongeBob SquarePants. So here is a yellow sponge with SpongeBob's face on it. And over to the right is an example of a sponge. So location and locomotion. Um, nearly all sponges are marine. They can live anywhere, but the largest number of sponges that we find are in the tropical area. And um, they're usually around coral reefs. And all are sessile, meaning they can't move at all. They're attached to the ground. Uh, so we're gonna learn about their polyp stage after their polyp stage, when their polyps land, wherever they land is where they grow, and they're stuck there for the rest of their lives. Um, so if you've ever watched SpongeBob, a lot of people like to ask about SpongeBob in my class, so I'm just going to go ahead and include it. If you've ever watched SpongeBob, the episode where SpongeBob tries to learn how to drive and he can never drive, and he never gets his driver's license, is true. Because sponges in real life can't move. So SpongeBob can't move. He can't drive just like a real sponge. Body plan and feeding. So, sorry, I keep looking down. I've got a copy of your notes down here in front of me so I can make sure we're all on the same page. Um, they're called filter feeders, meaning that because they can't move, they rely on water to move through them, and they filter the food out of their water. Give the bell a second. All bus riders are released. Have a great day. So the first thing that happens is the porosite, or these open pores on the sponge, allow water to come in and circulate in the canal. So water is flowing through the ocean and it flows right into this open area, this osculum, which is the open area in the middle of the sponge. From that point, the plankton is filtered out to eat 
by collar cells. The fancy name for those collar cells are choanocytes. We know it's a cell because it ends in this word site. All cells have this ending to their word. So what makes choanocytes special is they're these cells over here and they have a flagella and that flagella moves. It whips in a circle and that creates a current inside the sponge in that big open cavity and it helps to trap the food particles in the water on this mucousy collar area of the cell. So we've got a choanocyte right here. Here's its collar. Here's its flagella. The flagella is whipping the water. It's pulling the water through and the food is getting stuck in the mucus as it goes through this opening. So here's all those choanocytes that we just saw an up close view of. Here they are embedded in the actual sponge. So the water comes through this pore. The choanocytes are creating that current. The food is getting stuck in their mucus and in that collar. And then the water leaves through the top of the sponge or through the osculum, which is the opening on the top of the sponge. So it really is a basic lifestyle. Larger sponges have something in them called spicules. That spicule is a transparent siliceous or glass or calcium carbonate supporting structures. So if you look over here in this picture of the sponge, you can see these little yellow dividers. They look like star shapes almost. Those are the spicules. So those are either made out of bone or glass and those help keep the shape of the sponge. They stop that spongin from collapsing. So spongin, which brings me to my next point, is an elastic fiber inside the sponge that's made of protein. And that's what gives the sponge its feel and its shape. These can be combined and found in a gelatinous layer, which is called the mesophyll, in between the inner and outer cell walls. So we've got our mesophyll, and inside the mesophyll, we've got, excuse me, Oh, sorry, we've got spicules and spongin, which help the sponge keep its shape. They go through asexual reproduction, and there are two ways they can reproduce. The first one is fragmentation. So literally where there's a line of weakness, a cell falls off, and they're thrown off the parental body. Wherever they land is where they grow, and they grow into a whole brand new sponge. Remember, it's just a collection of specialized cells. So as long as one of each of those specialized cells is there, it can grow into a whole new organism. The second one is budding. So on the base of this sponge, it'll start to grow a brand new sponge in size. That sponge will keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. When it reaches its full growth, the bud breaks off and gets attached to a new substrate or the bud can remain. So either one can happen. All bus riders should be released at this time. Um, they can go through sexual reproduction, it is rare, but the collar cells become gametes. So gametes are um, eggs and sperm. Most sponges produce both eggs and sperm. So there isn't a female sponge and a male sponge in the ocean. They both are capable of producing male and female sperm and eggs, sorry, gametes. Um, the sperm are then released into the water and the current carries it to a new sponge where it enters the new sponge, comes in contact with an egg inside that sponge, and then an amphiblastula is formed. So, this is hard to explain. Um, maybe the next slide I'll explain it better. The amphiblastula is planktonic, so it floats in the water column and it's carried by the water column until it settles on the bottom and it changes into a minute sponge through a process called metamorphosis and it starts to grow. So essentially, the sponge, the collar cells become gametes and all of those sperm are released up and out of the top of the sponge in the osculum. The water carries them along the water column. Eventually, that water gets pulled into another sponge through its choanocytes to eat. When it gets pulled through, the sperm go in that opening too. When the sperm go in that opening, they encounter an egg inside the interior of another sponge. That's where that amphiblastula is formed. And then that amphiblastula breaks off and is carried up and out the osculum of the second sponge by the current. So this is what we've got going on here. An adult releases the sperm cells. The sperms enter another sponge and they fertilize an egg cell. A larva develops. That larva is then released and goes up and out the osculum. 
And then the larva settles on a hard surface and develops into an adult sponge. Gemmules are the coolest thing about sponges. So they're specialized internal buds and they're formed by sponges when the weather gets cold or dry. And those gemmules can survive those harsh conditions. Whereas the whole animal can't, that gemmule can. Um, it's a fluid filled ball of amoebocytes surrounded by a protective coat with spicules and it's released when a sponge dies. So when a sponge dies, because of any very re various reasons, harsh conditions, cold weather, dry weather, it gets pulled out of the water. It makes these gemmules and it releases them. And when conditions improve, uh, the gemmules are placed in water, they're placed in a good environment, those gemmules then bust open and those cells form a new sponge. So it's kind of a really cool way to ensure that just because conditions aren't right right now for it to grow and develop, conditions might become better in the future, and then the sponge can then start to grow and develop. So it's a really cool way to ensure that its offspring survive. So once you've gone through the PowerPoint, there's three assignments. There's a reading, if you click on it. It says sponge is a coloring worksheet. You aren't going to have to color. It does, I think, still have the coloring words in there. I think I got most of them out. But read through the sheet. You can use this reading to answer these questions. So it says sponge reading questions. All of the answers to this can be found in the sponge reading. The next one, it says sponge worksheet. It's a combination of different questions about sponges. It asks about the phylum that sponges are in. It asks about how they reproduce. It asks about the number of species of different sponges. These answers can be found in the reading. They can also be found in the PowerPoint. So you can use both of these. Some of them are fill in the blank. Um, so like this one says sponges are blank that trap food from water as it flows through them. So the answer would sound like the second or third slide and it's filter feeders. So there's only 11 questions here. The last thing you have to do for today is label a sponge. So it is just a worksheet that has a big picture on it of a sponge. And you're going to grab the correct labeling from down here and drag it up here. If you look at this picture, if you go back to your notes, you have this picture right here of a labeled sponge. So it has the mesophyll, the spicules, the spongocil, the coanocytes, the amoebocytes, all of that's labeled on here. So use that as your reference to help you label this assignment down here. And when you're done with that, you have your exit ticket and you're done for the day. So hopefully today's a pretty easy day for you. Have a good day and enjoy yourselves.